Hello, I am Dr. Ron Trailer, and welcome back to History 475. This, if I'm keeping track properly, should be video number six. Now, uh, we ended video five with the election of Thomas Jefferson, uh, and we talked a little bit about uh, his inauguration, but let's get further into his administration today on video six. All right. Uh, we had, first of all, let me go back to what we had referred to as the Revolution of 1800. Um, and let's talk about that just a little bit more, uh, because this is a very important turning point in American history. The Revolution of 1800, as we said, and I might not have used these words, but I at least implied, it was not a real revolution as we think of revolutions. There was no bloodshed. Uh, there was nothing like that. Now, bloodshed was feared, and that's probably why it was called the Revolution of 1800. But that violence never, never uh, took place. As a matter of fact, uh, what I said was what was really revolutionary about the Revolution of 1800 was that there was no bloodshed. There was a peaceful transfer of power from the Federalist Party under John Adams to the Republican Party under Thomas Jefferson. Something else that was rather revolutionary about the Revolution of 1800 was, was this. Prior to the election of Thomas Jefferson, uh, we had had two presidents, George Washington with two terms, John Adams with one term. Washington, Adams, and Adams were both Federalists. Neither of those two men, Neither Washington nor Adams was the leader of their own party because Alexander Hamilton had created the Federalist Party and Hamilton was still in charge of, he was the leader of the party. And then in 1800, Jefferson is elected president. Jefferson is a Republican. Jefferson and James Madison had uh, invented, had created the Republican Party. And of course, it had been in existence uh, for as long as the Federalist Party had been in existence. The reason why uh, the Federalist and the Republican Parties come into existence is deep, fundamental differences in their political philosophies. Remember, we talked about wide interpretation and narrow interpreta interpretation, all of those things. All right. Jefferson now becomes the first president to also lead his party. Let me say that again. Thomas Jefferson, as the result of the election of 1800, becomes the first president to actually ever lead his own party. And that uh, tradition, once established by Jefferson uh, as the result, of the election of 1800 would fundamentally uh, that would that would mean that all few future presidents would be the leaders of their parties. Now, it is true that Jefferson is now the president and he is now leading the uh, Republican Party, but he cultivated the support of the Federalists. Uh, what he attempted, at least attempted to do, was to cultivate congressional support for his programs and for his policies. Now, don't misunderstand me, he's still in charge. Um, but he would, he basically believed in the more modern uh, saying that you can catch more uh, flies with sugar than you can with vinegar, right? You try, need to try to get along with people. Now, it also is true that even though he did try to cultivate a close working relationship with the Federalists, it is also true that he chose Republican men uh, for the really, really, really important positions. Uh, his, his Attorney General was a Republican. His Secretary of War was a Republican. His Postmaster General was a Republican. 
he resisted the wholesale removal of Federalists uh, from lower positions. Uh, and rather than firing them and replacing them with Republicans, uh, he simply preferred to wait until the Federalists who had the jobs either quit or retired <laughs> or died. And then, and then he took that opportunity to replace them uh, with Republicans themselves. Now, We talked about um, John Adams's attempt to hack the courts. We said that Adams had run for the presidency in the year 1800, and he had lost. As a matter of fact, uh, his name uh, was, uh, he, he lost the uh, presidency in the House of Representatives. So, uh, between the time that the House elected Jefferson and the time that Jefferson was inaugurated, several months passed. And John Adams is still the president of the United States. John Adams, the Federalist, is still the president. And so Adams makes an effort. He makes the attempt. He knows that he's not going to be there after Inauguration Day. But because he is a Federalist, he uh, still prefers the policies and the politics of the Federalists. And so he tries to make the attempt to make sure that the Federalists still have some influence in the national government. And there are two ways that he attempts to do to accomplish that. First of all, he creates a number of new uh, judgeships. We've talked about this. He, he creates a number of new judgeships and he nominates Federalists to fill each and every one of those judgeships. And they are approved by the Senate, very constitutionally. Now, don't misunderstand me. The role that the Senate played in this was, was just open and above board. Remember, the Constitution says that the president nominates people for federal judgeships, but they don't get the job until the Senate confirms them. Well, the Senate confirmed them. So, uh, as far as Adams knew, uh, in the future, remember that federal judges are appointed for life. They don't serve two years, or four years, or six years. They don't run for election. They are appointed, they are confirmed, and then they stay in that job for life. So, Adams leaves office with the impression that even though future presidents might not be Federalists, uh, maybe future uh, members of the House and future members of the Senate might not be Federalists, the federal court system will be Federalists, and hopefully we'll make decisions based on Federalist policies. Now, the second thing that he does he, uh, is that he appoints the Federalist John Marshall to become the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Getting the job for Marshall was very similar uh, to what was needed for these other uh, these other judges. Uh, he had to be nominated by the president, Adams, and he had to be confirmed by the Senate, and he was. The difference is that the Constitution very clearly says that uh, the Supreme Court uh, has to have a chief justice and Marshall was nominated and confirmed in a very legal way. Now, Adams is gone. Jefferson is back. Jefferson is in office now as uh, the president. And Jefferson understood exactly what it was that Adams had attempted to do, what his long-term goal, his long-term purpose um, in uh, nominating all these Federalist judges and, and then their uh, approval by a Federalist-dominated Senate. And so what Jefferson uh, attempts to do, as a matter of fact, what he does successfully, he manages the repeal of those Federal judges. Now, the, the piece of legislation uh, that, that permitted these created these new federal judgeships, it was called the 
Judiciary Act of 1801, all right, that was done in the first months of the year 1801 while Adams was still the president. Okay, now Jefferson becomes president in March, and one of the first things he does is he begins the process of repealing the Judiciary Act of 1801. And so he abolishes all of those judgeships that Adams had created in the attempt to extend uh, the influence of the Federalist Party into the far future. Now, one thing that was not affected by the repeal, the repeal of the Judiciary Act of 1801 was the nomination and, uh, and approval by the Senate of, of John Marshall to be the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Those, the packing of the lower courts and the uh, making of John Marshall to be the Chief Justice, those are two different unrelated things, okay? So, uh, while all of these new federal judges lost their jobs when the Judiciary Act of 1801 was uh, was repealed, uh, John Marshall remained in his position as Chief Justice of the United States. And as an interesting sidelight, let me tell you this. John Adams' idea was a good idea. What he said was, even though Federalists are no longer in the White House, even if Federalists don't have a majority in the House, and even if Federalists don't have a majority in the U.S. Senate, that if we can, if Federalists control the federal court system, we can still influence what's going on. Well, that didn't work out the way he planned it because uh, the act was repealed. But John Marshall was a Federalist, and John Marshall remained... Uh, Chief Justice of the United, uh, United States Supreme Court for decades. Uh, very influential Chief Justice. And as a result, many of the decisions that were made by the United States Supreme Court reflected those old Federalist ideas even in the years after the Federalist Party had died. Marshall uh, had Marshall's ideas were Federalist ideas, and Marshall seemed to have a very strong influence on the other members of the United States Supreme Court, whether they were Federalists or not. And so he really did have an influence. So the Federalist influence does remain, but this time only in the U.S. Supreme Court, rather than all of these lower courts, as Adams had envisioned. There were still, uh, there were other conflicts between the Republic, uh, between Thomas Jefferson, the Republican who had Republican ideas, and, uh, and the remnants of the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party still existed, but they had lost the election of 1801. And when you look back in time, we realized that the Federalists would never again be as strong as they had been when John Adams was the president. But that certainly does not mean that they don't have influence. And they will have influence for a few more years before they finally just totally kick the bucket and die and fade away. Jefferson, for example, had always opposed the idea of the Bank of the United States, as a matter of fact. Um, you can make a strong point that the reason why the Federalists and the Republican parties come into existence is because that deep fundamental bedrock difference in their attitudes. And of course, we know that an even deeper reason was simply the way that they, they, they viewed the Constitution. Uh, the Federalists viewed it as a, uh, they had a very uh, wide interpretation of the Constitution. They believed it was simply a guideline for action by the government, while the Republicans believed that in a very narrow interpretation of the Constitution and believed that the only things that the uh, government could do were the things that they were given permission to do by the Constitution. 
By the way, that idea still exists today. Uh, without getting into the modern day politics, uh, let me just make some general statements for you to consider. Uh, the more liberal a person is, the more they are prone to view the Constitution as this living, breathing, changeable document that can suit the purposes of the modern generation. While more conservative people say, no, the only thing that you can do under the Constitution is what the Constitution gives specific permission to do. So, in many ways, that conflict uh, that started with Alexander Hamilton's attempt to create the Bank of the United States, uh, that conflict that resulted in the establishment of the Federalists and Republican parties, that conflict still exists. Now, we might use different words to explain those differences, but there is still a wide difference, is there not, uh, between the views of liberal Americans and conservative Americans. Now, there were some other things that Jefferson could do as a Republican, now who is now the president of the United States. Uh, first of all, remember that um, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion had happened in the western counties of Pennsylvania because Hamilton, a Federalist, had created this uh, excise tax on whiskey, this extra tax on whiskey. We've already talked about that. I'm not going to replow that, story, uh, that ground and retell that story, but you, you know now. Uh, if you don't, go back <laughs> to the appropriate video and review that. Um, Jefferson revokes, he repeals that excise tax on whiskey. Now, Jefferson was being true to his Republican roots when he did that. He felt, for example, that the Bank of the United States was unconstitutional. Uh, he also felt that the that, espe that especially added on whiskey tax was unconstitutional. The reality is that that whiskey tax had done what Hamilton had envisioned that it would do. Why did Hamilton create the whiskey tax? He wanted to pay off the government debt for the American Revolution. And that was happening. Hamilton had been right. Now, he might have done it in a wrong way. But the result was what Hamilton had expected it to be. And now Jefferson has canceled it. What happens? Well, the income to the federal government from that whiskey excise tax disappears. Now, it made a lot of people happy, especially on the western frontier. The same people that the whiskey tax had angered, right, under Hamilton, uh, are now very happy uh, about under Jefferson. But the reality is that the tax had been bringing in a lot of money to the federal government, and now that money was gone, and that, that reduces, that decreases government income substantially. So, frugality, all right, frugality, that's a fancy word. What does that mean? Uh, being a tightwad, right? Watching your pennies and, and your nickels. Frugality uh, became very important in the United States and in the United States government. So, what, what techniques were re remained for... Uh, through which the United States government could raise revenue. Well, uh, they could charge tariffs on uh, items that were imported into the United States from other countries. They could charge this extra tax on those things, and that money would go into the national treasury. And they could also sell Western lands. We, we talked about this in an earlier lecture as well. Now, fortunately, fortunately, um, both of those things were uh, were uh, very successful. 
Uh, a lot of countries of the world were sending things to the United States now that the American Revolution was over, right? And we were charging the special tax on those things, and that tax went into the National Treasury. And so things were looking good as far as raising money through these tariffs, these special excise taxes. Also, more and more and more people were moving into the so-called Western lands. Now, if you don't remember what that is all about, refer back to that for, uh, to the proper uh, video lecture there. Many people were beginning to move west, place, moving into places like uh, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, Ohio. These were the new uh, goals. Uh, uh, the new target areas for Americans who wanted to get away from uh, the original country, which they thought many people thought it was just getting too crowded. They needed it. They needed some breathing room. They needed to get back out into the woods. So, uh, and every time that the United States government sold some of this land to any of those settlers, that money went into the national treasury. So, uh, the money. Uh, being generated by tariffs and the money being generated by the sale of the Western lands um, was didn't make up for the loss of the revenue from the whiskey tax, but it made up for enough of it to where the American economy was not hurting. Now, remember what else is going on during this time? Um, Europe is still at war, especially. Uh, remember, by this time, Napoleon uh, is in charge of France. Um, and as it turns out, England will be France's primary enemy in what we refer to, we still refer to as the Napoleonic Wars. Now, we were still, the United States was still doing its best to trade with both sides uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, we will discover, maybe in this lecture, certainly by the next lecture, uh, that this was probably going to be a failure on the part of the United States. They, the, those countries simply were not going to permit the United States to continue to trade with what they consider to be their enemies. But for right now, we were trading with both England and France. Uh, and, every, and, and what that means is that the American economy was beginning to boom because of all these American goods and services that we were sending to Europe. It especially uh, helped our agricultural system because with, with uh, the war going on in Europe, uh, European farmers were seeing their farms destroyed, seeing their fields torn up by the hooves of marching men and, and the galloping horses. And so they needed to buy food from other places. And what was one of the best places uh, where they could find food? Sure, it was the United States. Now, we said that Jefferson was attempting to create a frugal government, a penny-pinching government. Jefferson had always distrusted permanent armies and navies. Jefferson was always afraid that if a country had a permanent army, professional soldiers, professional sailors, professional soldiers, these are not militias. Remember, militias are volunteers who only show up when they're needed and then they go back, they go back home, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a professional army, a professional navy. Jefferson really distrusted standing armies because he thought that they might lead to revolution. He thought that uh, armies and navies, if they didn't like what the government was doing, they would rise up, revolt, and would uh, kick the government out and take over and create perhaps a military dictatorship. So, in Jefferson's eyes, one of the ways to help uh, help us economically, and to avoid uh, takeover by the military, was to reduce the size of the military. And that's exactly what Jefferson does. He reduces the, the size of our army, 
and he reduces the size of our Navy. And of course, what that means is uh, he reduces the expenses of maintaining an army and a Navy, and that money then stays in the Treasury and can be used for other purposes. Now, by the way, Jefferson was not by himself in this distrust of a standing army. Many Americans uh, did not trust standing armies. Uh, once again, fearful that the military represented at least a possible military takeover, uh, which would result in tyranny. So, now, we didn't do away with the Army and the Navy under Jefferson. We just reduced its size significantly. Um, most military matters were left to state militias rather than to the United States Army. The Navy, which had already been reduced quite a lot after that fake war with France that we talked about, um, the Navy was made even smaller and weaker. And this, by the way, is going to come back to haunt the reduction in the size of the Army and in the size of the Navy is going to come back to haunt us uh, when the War of 1812 begins. And that begins right down the road, right? Okay. Now, something else significant, uh, one of many <laughs> things, significant things that happens during Jefferson's presidency is that the Atlantic slave trade is outlawed. Now, the Constitution, uh, as written in 1787, said that the Atlantic slave trade would be killed 20 years after the ratification of the Constitution. Now, let's talk about that. Every part of the Constitution as it was written in 1787, went into effect instantly and immediately upon its ratification. Every part, that is, except for the ban on the Atlantic slave trade. Americans were permitted to continue to bring enslaved, captured, enslaved Africans into the United States for another 20 years years. Now, uh, I teach African American history, and I'm aware that there are all kinds of theories about this, but I say, now, and this is just the gospel according to Dr. Trailer, you don't have to take this to the bank, but I say that in many ways that original constitution was friendly to slavery and it, it, rather than opposed to slavery. I mean, think about how the areas in which the Constitution was friendly to slavery. Well, one of the major things was uh, the Great Compromise that was, uh, that was uh, created at the Constitutional Convention, that uh, the slaves would not be counted as whole people. It would only be counted as three-fifths of a person. And then only uh, in order to elect members of the United States House of Representatives. That doesn't sound like that is a very uh, freedom-loving idea, right? Um, there, was a, there was a fugitive slave part of that original Constitution that said uh, if a slave escaped from his master, uh, and was able to get to uh, that, that that slave would always be liable to be recaptured by his master. That doesn't sound like it's anti-slavery. And of course, the ban on the Atlantic slave trade. Yes, it did ultimately, eventually stop the importation of African slaves to the United States. But it 20 years. And during that 20 years, what could slave masters do? They could buy more and more and more slaves. So that by the time the ban went into effect, they didn't care because they had enough slaves to do the work. All right. 
Nevertheless, in 1808, and again, the Constitution is ratified in 1788. So 20 years later, you count on your calendar, it's 1808. And in 1808, the ban on the Atlantic slave trade is supposed to go into effect. Now, we have a southern president, don't we? We have, a, uh, we have Thomas Jefferson, who is from Virginia, and who himself is a slave owner. Now, some of you might think, oh, God, no, Jefferson is not going to go along with this. But Jefferson does go along with this because Jefferson respects the content of the Constitution. And so 1808, Thomas Jefferson is the president of the United States. And when the ban on the Atlantic slave trade was supposed to go into effect, guess what? Jefferson signed the document and the Atlantic slave trade was dead. Now, let me finish the story, though. There are two kinds of slave trades. There was the Atlantic slave trade, which brought new slaves, newly enslaved Africans from Africa to the United States. That's the external slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade. That is what was banned in the Constitution. The other part of the slave trade is what we call the internal slave trade. Um, and that was the idea that a man from a man from uh, Virginia could buy a slave from a slave owner in North Carolina, right? It's 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 the slave trade that takes place within the United States that remained legal, and that remained legal until the Civil War stopped all of that stuff. Now, one other thing about the Atlantic slave trade before we, before we leave it. The Atlantic slave trade was officially banned in 1808. The reality is that the illegal Atlantic slave trade continued, good Lord, nobody knows, uh, until the Civil War began. Uh, between the years, we will never, ever know how many uh, Africans were illegally brought into the United States between the years 1808 and 1861, the beginning of the Civil War. We just simply don't know. But from what shipping records we can see and educated guesses and all that stuff, we think that an additional, uh, come on now. You're not going to believe this number. An additional 300,000 Africans made their way illegally into the United States um, in disobedience to the ban on the Atlantic slave trade. Okay, let's talk about something that affects us here in Louisiana on a personal level. Let's talk about the Louisiana Purchase. Remember that Louisiana had been settled by the French uh, in the early 1700s. It was a French colony. Uh, ownership of uh, Louisiana. And by the way, let's talk about the boundaries of Louisiana. <laughs> then, then, not now. Uh, now it's shaped like that little boot, right? We're all familiar with the size and shape of Louisiana today. Louisiana back then was ginormous. It was gigantic. It went from the Canadian border <laughs> all the way to the Rocky Mountains and back to the Mississippi River. It was a huge place. Now, that huge piece of land that originally belonged to France uh, was later, uh, uh, this is not a Louisiana history course. I invite you to join me for my Louisiana history course, uh, History 321. Uh, in fact, I'm teaching a section this semester. But we don't have time to talk about why it is that 
France owned it first, and Spain took possession of it, and then a little later on, France took possession of it again. It is enough for us to say uh, that Napoleon of France saw that huge part of Louisiana that was located in North America. He saw that as an opportunity to create a Western part of his empire. He, he was already conquering much of Europe by this time. A very uh, powerful French army had invaded all of its neighbors and had conquered them. Uh, Napoleon then turns his eyes to North America. Uh, and he sees that France owns that huge piece of land that would become the Louisiana Purchase. Not yet, though. It's still owned by France. There's something else that, that France owns in the Western Hemisphere, and that is the island, the Caribbean island of Haiti, H-A-I-T-I. -I. Haiti was one of those fabulously wealthy sugar islands that we talked about. Remember we said that they were making so much money off the sugar cane that they, they could afford to buy food from other places around the world and have it shipped to Haiti and still make money. Well, Haiti was one of those Caribbean sugar islands. And guess what? Haiti was owned by France. So Haiti was pumping bajillions of dollars into the French treasury. And Napoleon envisioned a Western Hemisphere empire based on Haiti and Louisiana because he knew uh, that Louisiana was probably going to serve as a source of a lot of wealth. Uh, naval stores, which we've talked about, uh, precious, <clears throat> I'm sorry, precious furs, uh, that just starts the list. All right, now, When Napoleon became, uh, ultimately becomes the emperor of France, uh, the Secretary of State was James Madison. He was Jefferson's Secretary of State. And this is what Madison said uh, when, uh, when Napoleon became the emperor of France. He said, the late defection of France has left only America the only theater on which true liberty can have a fair trial. Right. So uh, even Madison was very leery of Napoleon and what Napoleon's motives were and what Napoleon's plans were. The United States... Uh, for years, had been France's closest ally. We've talked about the alliance of 1778. We've talked about all those things. But once, especially once after the French Revolution breaks out, and especially after Napoleon comes to power, the United States began to change its attitude toward France, and they now thought of France only as just another European nation. Um... So, France owns New Orleans. France owns the West Bank of the River all the way to Canada. Remember the conversation that we had about Spain? If you control both sides of the river, you can literally legally stop commercial traffic on the river. Well, we had settled that with France, hadn't we? Pinckney's Treaty. But now Spain is no longer the owner of Louisiana. The French now own it again, and the Americans are worrying again that France might stop commerce on the river because they own both sides of the river. Jefferson sends an American diplomat by the name of Robert Livingston uh, to France. Livingston is the new ambassador to France. Uh, and this happens in 1801, all right? Uh, the year that Jefferson becomes the president is the year he sends Robert Livingston to Paris uh, as, the, um, as the American ambassador to, to France. Now, uh, here's another quote that I love from Jefferson. 
the day that France takes possession of New Orleans, which they had already done, is the day we must marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation. Uh, it was what Jefferson was saying was that uh, we are too weak to defend ourselves. And if the French uh, take control of Louisiana, then we are going to have to really make an effort to make uh, closer friends out of the British, because the British at that time had the most powerful army and the most powerful navy in the world. Plus, Jefferson uh, knew that he was getting ready to reduce the size of our army and our navy. So Jefferson knew that bad times were ahead of America, or at least there was a possibility of bad times ahead for America. Now, when Livingston got there, uh, he attempted to talk the French out of their idea of creating this empire. But the best we could do was to ask. We couldn't force the French to do anything. They were so much power, more powerful than we were militarily. Those The French were very polite, though, and those negotiations dragged on with no seemingly resolution, no seeming resolution. Suddenly, out of the clear blue sky one day, Napoleon's foreign minister, a fellow by the name of Talleyrand, T-A-L-L-E-Y-R-A-N-D, Talleyrand. Talleyrand basically fundamentally walks into the room and out of the clear blue sky says to Livingston, would you like to buy Louisiana? Livingston was shocked. Then he heard why Napoleon wanted to sell Louisiana. What had happened was that the African slaves on the island of Haiti who were being terribly abused by their French owners. Those slaves had revolted against their slave owners and, and had kicked the French out and had declared the Republic of Haiti. By the way, uh, the second oldest republic in the Western Hemisphere is the island nation of Haiti. Now, Napoleon tried to get Haiti back from the former slaves who were now in charge of the island. He sent a French army. Now remember, the French army was one of the best in the world. He sends a French army to Haiti under the command of, uh, of his, uh, of his brother-in-law. Um, to, and they've just figured it would, it would be really easy to defeat these uh, smart aleck upstart uh, slaves, former slaves, and put them back in their place. And where was their, where were the, what was the place they were going to be put into? Return them to slavery. Well, uh, it didn't turn out like that for the French army. By the way, the name of the French, uh, Napoleon's brother-in-law was Leclerc. L-E-C-L-E-R-C, -E -E Leclerc. Um, the French army found all kinds of, encountered all kinds of problems in Haiti, not the least of which was disease. All these, <laughs> you know, what comes, what goes around, comes around, isn't that the old saying? Remember what happened when the early Europeans got to North America? Remember what happened to the, to the Indians? 90 to 95 percent of them died because they had no immunity to the European diseases. Things that the Europeans had immunity or partial immunity to proved to be deadly for the American Indians. Well, the reverse of that happened uh, with the French. Remember, Haiti is a Caribbean island. It is a tropical island, and it has all these tropical diseases that the people of Haiti, to which the people of Haiti had developed an immunity or at least a partial immunity. And these French soldiers grow, uh, show up uh, and they start dying like flies. 
yellow fever, all these tropical diseases against which they have no immunity. So, uh, uh, the disease is one of the enemies of the French army. Another enemy of the French army, which proves to be very effective, are the former slaves who now control Haiti. The former slaves understand with, with no doubt that what they are facing if they lose is going to be re-enslavement and probably even greater punishment because they had stood up against the French and the French slave owners. And so the former slaves of Haiti had, as we would say in the South, they had a dog in this fight, right? They knew that they knew what they had to lose their, and what they had to lose, not just their lives, but their freedom. And so the Haitian army really uh, uh, does well in fighting what's left of the French army. By the way, Leclerc himself dies of some tropical disease. Uh, the survivors get back on their ships and they sail back to France, to France with their tail between their legs. And Haiti has remained free until this day. Now, when Napoleon, remember that his plan to create this empire in North America was based on two things. One was the wealth of Haiti. And two was the resources that no one even knew about, but that everyone knew had to be there in Louisiana. Well, now Haiti was gone. And Napoleon decides to, as a gambler would say, uh, Napoleon decided to cut his loss. Uh, he realized that uh, the dream of a North American empire was gone. Um, and so he sends Talleyrand, Talleyrand, in to meet with Livingston to make the offer, do you want to buy Louisiana? Now, what was the Louisiana that Livingston was buying? Well, no one really knew what its exact boundaries were, but they knew that it was enormous. It went all the way to Canada and the Rocky Mountains, right? It was a huge piece of, of ground. Now, remember what we said, la I think it was last lecture, we said that back in those days, uh, communication was only as fast as the fastest transportation. All right, so there's Livingston in Paris, and there's Jefferson in Washington, D.C., two, maybe three months away by sailing ship one way. So Livingston understand, understands that it's going to take at least, if he reports, if he asks Jefferson for permission, it's going to take two at least two months for the request to get from Paris to uh, Washington, and it's going to take at least two months for Jefferson's answer to get back. And this was too good a deal to pass up. Uh, by procrastinating, Livingston was very much afraid that uh, Napoleon would, would withdraw the offer to the Americans and might make the same offer to somebody else, the Spanish or the French or whatever. And so, Livingston takes it upon himself to accept Talleyrand's offer. Well, by the way, I should not omit this. By this time, there was another famous American diplomat in Paris with Livingston. It was James Monroe, who in later years would become, uh, let's see, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison. He would become the fifth president of the United States. So Monroe plays an important role in uh, negotiating the deal between the French uh, and the Americans. So we buy... Louisiana for $15 million, which at the time was an, an obscenely high amount of money. As it's turned out, though, I mean, think of all the wealth that has been created in, in what 
was at one time the Louisiana Purchase. It far outshadows $15 million. But at the time, that was a lot of money. The uh, Monroe and Livingston asked Talleyrand, how big is this place? Can you can you give us the specific boundaries of it? And Talleyrand laughed in their face. He said, it is as big as what you can keep. Right? Now, remember what, when, when we talked about the differences between the Federalist and the Republican Party, one of the main differences in their political philosophy was that the Federalists said that the uh, they believed in a wide interpretation of the Constitution, while the Republicans believed in a narrow interpretation. You could only the Republicans believed you could only do those things which the Constitution said you could do. Oh, poor Jefferson. He found himself in a real problem. Remember, Jefferson is one of the creators, along with Madison. Jefferson is one of the creators of the Republican Party. He knows as just as well as anybody what the what the beliefs of the Republican Party is uh, are beliefs are yeah uh, subject verb agreement, um, and he understood uh, that Republicans generally believed in this idea of a uh, narrow interpretation of the Constitution. Now, here's the problem that Jefferson was faced with. Nowhere in the Constitution of the United States did it say that we could buy land from another nation. And so, by the Republican Party's own admission, if we did that, it would be unconstitutional because it's not mentioned in the Constitution at all, is it? Now, before we sort of giggle uh, at the hypocrisy of the Republicans, let me tell you this. The Federalists opposed the Louisiana Purchase. And the reason they opposed it was because the Constitution didn't mention buying land from another nation. Had there been a Federalist president, if Adams had still been the president, he probably, of course, we'll never know this because we're playing what-if history again, aren't we? But isn't it fun to play what-if history every once in a while? Jack, uh, Adams would have probably approved the purchase because he said that the Constitution only serves as a guideline. He believed in a wide interpretation of the, Const so, of the Constitution. So with regard to the Louisiana Purchase, the two parties sort of swap sides, don't they? They sort of swap beliefs. The Republicans go from believing in a narrow interpretation to a wide interpretation, while the Federalists go from believing in a wide interpretation to a narrow interpretation. Can you spell the word hypocrisy, please? They were both sort of hypocritical, weren't they? It was a reversal of their old, uh, rather, by now, long-standing um, policies. Um, in any case, uh, the U.S. Senate approved the purchase uh, because it was also done by treaty. It was done by uh, treaty and money exchanging hands, $15 million. The Senate ratified the treaty that authorized the Louisiana Purchase, and the United States took possession of Louisiana from France uh, in December of 1803. In New Orleans, by the way, because remember, all of the Louisiana Purchase was west of the Mississippi River, except for New Orleans, and it was on the East Bank. Now, the Spanish were not happy with this purchase at all. Remember, the Spanish had owned Louisiana for a while before they lost it back to France. Uh, the Spanish. Uh, looked at Louisiana as a buffer zone between themselves and the United States. The Spanish, remember the Spanish had had a pretty bad experience with the United States in 1795 with Pinckney's Treaty. The Spanish were no longer a powerful, they still owned a lot of land, but they were, they were becoming weaker and weaker and weaker, and they looked to their, and what did they own 
Let me let me let's go through the list again. What land did the Spanish own in the Western Hemisphere? Well, they owned a third of North America, right? I mean, they owned California and Nevada and Arizona and New Mexico and Texas. They owned all of Mexico. They owned all of South America except for Brazil. But the Spanish, they might not admit it to the other nations of the world, but the Spanish knew that they were much weaker than they had ever been. And they saw this young, upstart nation to their east called the United States, and they were intimidated by the United States. And so when the United States when word is received that the United States has bought this huge piece of land down the middle of the North American continent, uh, the Spanish government is very uneasy about this because their fears, it seems, their fears are coming true. That buffer zone between them, uh, between the United States and Spain, has pretty much disappeared. Overnight. Now, Spain keeps Florida. So, so in addition to all the other land that I mentioned just a few seconds ago, Spain also owns Florida. And Spain and, and Florida goes all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River and includes all of that land up to the 31st parallel that we talked about with the Indies Treaty with the exception of New Orleans. And that was French. Uh, in 1810, I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story, but let's, let's continue to talk about Louisiana-related stuff. Uh, a lot of people had, had left the United States and had gone to Florida during, the, uh, during and right after the American Revolution. Many of these people were British citizens who did not want to live in the United States. They went to they went to Spanish Florida. Remember, let me say it one, once again. By this time, Spain Spain was weaker than it had ever been, and even though laws were on the books in Florida, Spanish Florida, and even though at least on paper. The people of Spanish Florida were being taxed. The reality was that the Spanish government was too weak to enforce its laws or to uh, collect its taxes. And that was just custom made for many of the people who wanted to leave the United States. They could go to a place where they could live by their own rules, where government was minimum, if it existed at all. People continued to come into Spanish Florida, but as time passes, more and more of those people were not the old English loyalists, but they were Americans who were coming to Florida, by the way, for the same reasons as the loyalists, right? Your laws, taxes. There finally got to be so many Americans or former Americans uh, in Spanish Florida uh, that in the year 1810, uh, some of the residents of Spanish Florida uh, revolt against Spanish rule and they proclaim uh, this new nation that they refer to as the Republic of West Florida. Now, I am giving you the strictly the highlights of the Republic of West Florida. If you want to know a lot about it, you want to get chapter and verse of the Republic of West Florida, you need to take one of Dr. Sam Hyde's classes because Dr. Hyde is one of the acknowledged experts on the Republic of West Florida. Now, uh, today, uh, our, we have very little contact or knowledge of the Republic of West Florida, except those of you who commute on I-12 from Baton Rouge, or from Dinner Springs, or from Livingston Parish, or from Slidell, Covington, Goodby, right? 
the southeastern, you'll notice there on I-12 occasionally, periodically, there are signs, big blue signs with a white star in the middle of it, and it says, Republic of West Florida Freeway. Uh, that's one of the few remaining reminders that this part of the country, where you are sitting right now, probably listening to this and watching this video, was once a part of an independent nation called the Republic of West Florida. Now, it didn't last long. It lasted less than two months. But last, it, it came into existence, and it was a real country for a while until it was sort of swallowed up into the United States. And like I say, Dr. Hyde can give you all of those details. Okay. Uh, that is one hour. That worked out beautifully, didn't it? Okay. Uh, this is, uh, this has been, check my notes. This has been video lecture number six. Uh, and we will continue with video lecture number seven. And we will continue to talk about Jefferson and his administration. And I'll see you soon.